Hi, this is James with Iad and Sam from Canonical. Today we are wrapping up our series on rich country, poor country. So in all three of the books that we read for this series, The Disaster Tourist, The Sympathizer, and Paradise, we see violence as a tool that's used by richer countries. In these books, how else do rich countries exert their influence on the poorer countries? I think that richer countries have the opportunity to establish for the world what is considered a good life, what's considered normal. Like, even though the protagonist of The Sympathizer is very critical, he enjoys many aspects of his life in the U.S., and he enjoys many of the things that are available to him in the U.S. that are not available in Vietnam. I think we kind of see that in paradise. If we see the richer country, in this case, I guess the Arabs, enjoying an easier life than the people of the, what, what do they call them? They're like, they're the Swahili people, but they're like people in the mountains, not the people of the coast, right? So the people in the mountains seem to be rather impoverished, whereas the Arab traders on the coast seem to be well-to-do. And you have the sense that even though he's an indentured servant, his life is better. When the Germans come in, for example, in Chatu's village, is it just strength? strength and, and threat of violence that convinces them to relinquish the goods and to let uh, Aziz and everyone go? Or is there something else? I think it's mainly strength, but there is also the mystique or the mythology that we talked about in, I think, the last yeah. episode, where people of that area believe Germans to be somehow supernatural. I think that the idea of security that is offered by the German presence is also very attractive in one way. And it creates a vacuum that people are very happy to have the Germans fill, where people like Aziz are constantly under this threat of having their stuff taken away from them. And if it comes down to being subservient to the Germans in order to keep their stuff, I think a lot of people would be willing to take that bargain. As long as they get to continue living in the lifestyle they're accustomed to, that it's okay to serve another master. Well, it just reminds me of something I talked about and I think the review episode, which is the most interesting part of this book for me, is how at the beginning it seems like they were living in a stateless society. And near the end, it seems to be moving toward this kind of colonial government and this allure of order that comes with it. Whereas at the beginning, you don't have this kind of order. Things are done almost piecemeal. You know, these bargains are struck on a personal level, individually, and you don't have this sense of security that Yed was talking about. What about the difference between state violence that we see in The Sympathizer and Paradise and this kind of corporate control that we see in The Disaster Tourist? Is that a separate thing, or is it just kind of a different instance of the same kind of power? Do we know where Paul is based? No. I don't think we know that, but I think it would be a safe guess to assume that it's not a company from Mui. The interesting thing for me, as someone who's interested in history, is that because Paradise is about German colonialism in Africa and not British or Dutch colonialism, you know, like, like the British and the Dutch and other European countries, especially the Northern European countries, they established companies like the East Indian Company, West Indian Company, that kind of stuff. And that relationship between corporate and state is intertwined. But I don't think that was the case in the German colonization of Africa. 
I think then that Paul could be seen as an evolution of that because, you know, these companies existed in one respect to insulate the foreign country's government from whatever abuses the country suffered, whatever abuses the uh, the company was inflicting upon this poor country. Paul, I don't think, serves any particular country. It serves itself. So rather than, you know, the Dutch East India Company, it kind of morphs into the Paul Mui Company that serves Paul rather than serving Holland or wherever else. So then that ends up being more of a statement on capitalism, global capitalism, than it does the interactions between rich and poor countries. I mean, that's there too, but it's not just that a rich country like Korea is exploiting a poorer country like Mui or Vietnam. It feels like it's exploitative on another level, that it's pushing the issue away from Korea and saying it's not just Korea, it's also a global issue. I mean, theoretically, countries remain accountable to the United Nations and International Court of Justice, right? But a, a country can be held accountable. But what about Paul? Who is Paul accountable to? They're supposed to be accountable to wherever they're recognized as their like home country. But I don't know. I mean, somebody else might say shareholders, but then you'd have to ask, well, do the shareholders really care? Probably not. 